All right, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'd like to thank Layla for providing Layla water. <laughs> that I got from the chat. Remember, refill this, save the earth a little bit. Don't grab any bottle at the time. I'm just reiterating what you said last time. Okay, so this is joint work with uh, Dan Geyer, who's now a PhD student at the University of Washington. And the corresponding paper of all the theorems you see are in this journal of intersequences paper. Um, that actually, I have three copies up here. If anyone would like one at the end of the talk. Okay, so let's begin. Um, I'm going to start with uh, talking a little bit about my collaborator because he's amazing. Um, his name is Dan. This is him, Dan and I before COVID. This is us proving some one of hundreds of Fibonacci, uh, Fibonacci identities, as everyone in this room has done in the infancy of their research. This is us before COVID. Uh, and here we are uh, a year into COVID. And notice that you can see our nose and our mouth. So what does that mean? <laughs> We're vaccinated. <laughs> and here we are working at home. And there's some Fibonacci. My home, sorry, we don't live there. At my home, and that's some Fibonacci stuff there. Okay, so what is the origins of this project? Um, in the very first issue of the Fibonacci Quarterly in 1963, so it's issue number one, the following question was posed by I.D. Ruggles, show that every sum of 20 consecutive Fibonacci numbers is divisible by the 10th Fibonacci number, uh, F10, namely the number 55. So for example, we have a set of numbers starting with F1, and then we go 20 numbers, the sum is 17,710, and indeed that's 55 times something. Let's go start at another place. Right. How about we start at F4? And then we add up those 20 numbers and we get 75,020. Indeed, that's 55 times something. Let's look at start at F6. And then we get a bigger sum, obviously, because it's bigger numbers. 196,405. Indeed, that's 55 times something. What's the elephant in the room with these somethings? 3571, 1364, 322. You've all failed. <laughs> These are what kind of numbers? 322 is the 12th Luca number. 1364 is that a Luca number? You're all thinking yourself now, right? That's okay. Maybe you're obsessed with Pell in the, the Pell Luca sequence, which I'm doing now. Okay. So uh, is that significant? Yes. Is it really interesting? Yes. Is it part of my talk? No. Did I talk before in Luca a lot about this yesterday and today? Yes. Um, but uh, that's a whole different talk. In itself, uh, it is a very interesting thought. Okay, so what we lived, we observed, we were looking at this infinite sequence of sums of 20 consecutive Fibonacci numbers, and then we considered the GCD of these infinite sequences, as, as we see here in the bottom line. And we observed that 55 not only divides each of these sums, but also seemed to be the greatest common divisor of these sums. So I'm going to shrink this a little bit because it seems to be jumping mentally every time I click. Um, so what's special about 55 and what's its connection to the sum of 20 consecutive Fibonacci numbers? So this is my other collaborator named Dr. Wolf, who's a very clever dog, as you'll see. And uh, Dr. Wolf believes that 10 is half of 20. And I have confirmed that with computer evidence using mathematical. Indeed, that is true. 10 is half of 20. And then he barked the following conjecture. Whoop! The GCD of this infinite sequence of sums is F20 over 2, and indeed that's F10. Proof by dog. So, uh, what did we prove in light of the letter? We showed that there's nothing special about the number 20. This phenomenon holds for all length k sequences, the length k sums that were k is of, uh, divisible by 4. So, more precisely, we proved that k is congruent to 0 mod 4, the GCD of the sum of k consecutive Fibonacci numbers equals the F Fibonacci number FK over 2. That is one of our tiny little things that we proved. Tiny, so I say that's just the tip of the iceberg. The full iceberg is much cooler than the cool, like the cigarettes, result above. So we're gonna establish some terminology first. Terminology that I'm gonna speed through, because if you don't know it, you don't belong in the room. So generalized Fibonacci, actually this is a good one. I mean, everyone has a different definition of a generalized Fibonacci sequence. So this is a definition I'm using for generalized Fibonacci sequence. We have this, the recurrent you know, the current numbers of some of the previous, and then we have some integral initial conditions. If the integral conditions are zero and one, we recover Fibonacci. If it's two and one, we recover Luca. Okay, all good. Um, for brevity, we're going to use the term Fibonacci sequence. If you think you hate that word, I made it up. I didn't make it up. Or Benjamin did. Your fault. Okay. <laughs> but I love it. Fibonacci. Yes. Well, uh, Benjamin Quinn. So says Thomas Koshi in a 2000 well, a book that apparently came out your, your book. Um, 
Okay, so more notation. We have the generalized Bazano period. If you take any Gibranati sequence, mod m, it's definitely going to repeat. It's periodic. What's the length? We're going to call that length um, pi, pi sub g, not g1 of m, just meaning gr is congruent to the first initial condition mod m, and gr plus 1 is congruent to the second initial condition mod m, and r is the smallest number possible where that happens. Uh, so in the Fibonacci setting, we're going to use pi sub f of m to denote the Bazama period of the Fibonacci sequence and pi sub l of m to denote the Bazama period of the Lukács sequence. So now the new notation is the following curly f, curly l, and curly g. These are the stars of our show. We're just talking about curly f is the GCD of the infinite sequence of k consecutive sums of Fibonacci, uh, respectively Luca for curly l, respectively Fibonacci for curly g. And a uh, fun fact, for Abba, Dan wants to preface that just for me, because I'm like immature, I love, we could call this Fib sum, Luke sum, and Jib sum. He didn't want to be associated with this, me publicly saying this, but I'm going to do that. Mostly his issue was because Jib sum refers to a GCD and not just a sum. And so just get that in your head. When I say Luke sum or Fib sum, I'm talking about the GCD of the Fibonacci. Okay. So I'm going to say Fibs, I'm going to say Fib sum of K, Luke sum of K, or Jib sum of K. All right. So this is the star of our show, so understand this. Uh, it's not much to understand, it's a but. Okay, so these are our results for pip sum of k, loop sum of k, and jip sum of k. Um, and uh, so the top two rows, clearly k is even. Why did I choose not to just say k is congruent to zero mod four in the first row and k congruent to two mod four in the second row? Because I wanted everything to live in the same moduli class because we got some different stuff going with the odd numbers when k is odd. Um, so. We're gonna, um, so there's a lot on this slide, I mean, to parse, and it's really interesting to, to, to get into the paper to see how we got these different values. Um, but we basically, well, you'll see how we do this. Because um, Dr. Wolf was going to ask us the question, how did Dan and Abba prove those four theorems on the previous slide? Good question, Dr. Wolf. We made two char equivalent characterizations for the gypsum of K, for the, remember this symbol means to, the GCD of any every sum of k consecutive Fibonacci numbers, sum of every k consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So the first the first formula of number one of two is the following: the largest integer that divides every sum of k consecutive Fibonacci numbers is given by the GCD of these two terms. Just plug in your k value and for those things in your Fibonacci sequence. All right. So I mean, this is a really simple formula. A very simple formula. It looks like. But how do we prove it? The heart of the proof is taking our, our sequence of sums and then looking at each individual sum and writing it out as this little value here. Just, we did that by just taking Gibbonacci identities. If we didn't, if it wasn't proven already, we proved it. So like a few pages of the paper is just getting this thing done together. And then we played with inequalities and I can kind of talk through that. And I, I think I will because the, 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 the gist of this is quite easy. So we, we, what we want to show is that the, Gypsum of k is less than or equal to this GCD on the right, and this, this thing on the right is less than or equal to the gypsum of GCD. So, to show that gypsum of k is less than or equal to the GCD of these two values, well, the gypsum of this infinite sequence of sums is definitely less than or equal to the GCD of the very first two sums. It can't increase anymore. It's definitely bounded above by the, the sum, the first sum when n is one, and the second sum when n is two. So let's consider those two sums. When n is one, um, we have f zero here. So this whole term on the left of the, of the sum symbol disappears and we have f one. So when n is one, the first sum is equal to gk plus two minus g two. And when n is two, fn minus one is equal to number one and fn is the number one. I don't need a point here, anyway. Um, and so then we have gk plus one minus g1 and gk plus two minus g2. And the GCD of those two terms of the first thing when n is zero and the term when n is one, just using basic GCD properties, is exactly this term on the right, the GCD of these two values. And to show that the, the, this thing on the right is less than or equal to the gypsum of k, let's just call this the value q, this thing here, GCD of gk plus one minus g1. Let's call that q. So Q is equal to that GCD of those two terms. Clearly Q divides GK plus one minus G1 and clearly Q divides GK plus two minus G2. But that's what's beautiful about our, our representation here. We have this, we have a GK plus one minus G1 and a GK plus two minus G2. So that means that this GCD on the right divides every single term here on the left. So we have this thing on the right is less than or equal to that. 
So we have, since we have mutual um, uh, uh, left, this thing is left equal to that, and that's less than, less than equal to that, then you have equality. Okay. So doing that proof is the thing that's going to make me go over time. But uh, Dan insisted I do that proof. So I did. Okay. That's my class. <laughs> okay. So the formula number two is a little bit more obscure and really super cool. The largest integer that divides every sum of k gets like different not numbers is the least common multiple of all the moduli values m such that the generalized horizontal period pi g not g1 of m divides k. So now this looks obscure because we're talking about uh, the GCD of an infinite sequence of sums and we're relating it to an LCM of moduli values of the horizontal period that divide uh, k. I mean, that's got to look bizarre. And it is bizarre, but uh, the gist of the proof is the following fascinating and unexpected connection. These are quotes from the anonymous referee, and I think I, 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 I'm not tooting my own horn, but we think it's fascinating and unexpected. This is a really crazy biconditional. So M divides the GCD of the sum of take of every sum of take consecutive Fibonacci numbers, if and only if the Pisano period, the generalized Pisano period of M divides the value K. So why should that be? And I'm gonna give a proof of least left to right because it's not that bad. So let's assume the left side, M divides this uh, gypsum of K. Then by the first characterization, the definition of, oh sorry, the formula one of G gypsum of K is the following GCD of two terms. So if M divides the GCD of those two terms, clearly it divides each term. And then if I write this in congruence uh, fashion, then we have GK plus one is congruent to G1 mod M and GK plus two is congruent to G2 mod M. But that just means it repeats then. The, the sequence is repeating uh, the G1 followed by G2 starting at this value. But that only happens, that happens in the Bozano period, the generalized Bozano period. So whatever this value is, it's a K, it's a multiple of the Bozano period. It has to be. I want to get some faces to go, ah, that's clear. One face? You can fly to me, just say, yeah. Okay, good. All right, so that's clear. Um, so let's use the first formula to prove the familiar result of ID Ruggles, the Ruggles problem. So I'm just plugging this into this formula and fine and dandy. And this slide is just showing you that the first formula works in this one case. Is the second formula really convenient to, to do this thing? No, because then we need to find all the moduli values M such that the generalized horizontal period of M divides this value 20. And that's a less useful thing, but it has really cool, the second, the previous formulation, this formula here has other values that you're about to see, other, sorry, value, uh, other merits that you're about to see. Okay, so applications. Um, the largest modulus M yielding a given Pisano period pi sub f of f. So an open question for anyone who wants to do this, this is a good question to think about. For a given period K and a Gibonacci sequence with fixed initial values G0 and G1, what is the largest modulus value M that has that given value K as its generalized Pisano period? That's a really good, fun question. And maybe you want to solve it after you see how we get it in the Fibonacci case. Let me give a, an example in Fibonacci case. So we want to compute the largest modulus value that yields the Zama period, say, of 60. So uh, familiar, like m equals 10, the Fibonacci sequence mod 10, it gives a sequence of length 60. Can we get higher values? Well, of course we can get higher values, but what's the largest we can get? So um, for reasons to be known very certainly, I'm going to tell, tell you that when we set k equals 60, Fib sum of 60, meaning if I take the greatest common divisor of any sum of k consecutive, sorry, of 60 consecutive Fibonacci numbers, that GCD is F30, which is the number 832,040. So you're probably saying, who cares? What is that connected to, to this problem above in the title of the slide? Well, remember the fascinating unexpected connection, that weird lemma that we use to prove formula two. Um, M divides F. K, if and only pi sub f of m divides k. So if we're setting k to be 60, m divides f 60, if and only if the Bazano period of m divides 60. Well, let's internalize that a little bit. If the Bazano period of m is equal to 60, we want to know all the possible m values. That, remember, that's the question. All the possible m values to have this. Well, pi sub f of m is 60. Clearly, pi sub f of m divides 60, but because of this biconditional, M has to divide F60, which is this giant number, 832,040. So that's definitely the largest possible number, but maybe it's not achieved. Maybe M just has to divide 832,040. But can we actually attain that? Well, it's an easy mathematical calculation in seconds. 
to you know to figure out if the sequence repeats 60 with uh, our Fibonacci sequence mod 832,040. So yes, this is a way, and then we prove that actually we always attain it with this value, and that's our one fun theorem. Uh, if we have an even integer, pi, our fib sum of k is the um, is the uh, maximum modulus that gives a, a period, a zonal period of period length k. Um, so that's one application, which is kind of neat. Um, I think it's kind of neat. Another example is a new formula for L sub i. I mean, why do we need a new formula? Well, I mean, just notice here in the second row, all of these values are LK over two. Not necessarily when K is congruent to uh, zero mod four, but when K is congruent to two mod four, they're all LK over two. So no matter what the initial conditions are, if I take the sum of K consecutive, um, every sum of K consecutive uh, Fibonacci, Luca, or generalized Fibonacci numbers, the GCD is always LK over two. So let's exploit that. Um, here we have the Binet formula, but you can toss it out if you like and have a new way to do this. Uh, when k is congruent to 2 mod 4, well, 2, 6, or 10, that means it's congruent to 2 mod 4, then if we divide k by 2, we get an odd number. So I like to joke uh, to my class, this is my one joke, if you have a number, that even number that's congruent to 2 mod 4, it's even, but it's barely even. It's like you blow on it and it'll suddenly become odd. Tough crowd, tough crowd. Okay. <laughs> okay, so so the theorem is if I have an odd positive integer, I can and I take any single Gibbonacci sequence that I want, anything at all that has relatively prime initial conditions. I can compute L sub odd, and it's going to be exactly this number. For J, I can just plug that in. So this is is this a useful formula? No. Is it a cool formula? Yes, because you can take any Gibbonacci sequence and compute L sub odd. Um, Okay, and lastly, uh, an open question that was recently closed. What's the GCD of the sums? Instead of k consecutive uh, numbers, how about squaring them? Squaring each term and then adding them up. Well, we, in the paper, Dan and I found out that this beautiful result, if you take the sum of k consecutive squares of Fibonacci numbers when k is even, you, we, data gave us fk, which is great. k didn't have to be congruent to zero or two mod four, any even. There was less restriction in the square case, which is kind of interesting. And then uh, a random fellow who's now a really dear friend named Dr. Jürgen Stolper in Freiburg, Germany, emeritus faculty, um, he wrote us and said, I think I can solve this problem. And so then him and I went to town on all this stuff and proved so much more than this one single box, which is what Dan and Alva's conjecture was. We proved all the other boxes. And uh, Dan, you might say, why wasn't Dan involved? Well, Dan is preparing to go to first year grad school. He went to Budapest, did PCMI, did this Connecticut something. He was really too busy to handle this. And that's fine. That's totally fine. He's got so many more papers in his future because he's young. Okay. So last slide in order of Regal Flores. Thank you. Why is it in order of Regal Flores? Remember what he did the other day? One more slide. Future direction. Remember what he did? He's stealing this. Okay, I just want to say to talk about some future directions because I have a new Dan guy. Sorry, a new person who's got her own person, Janae Schrader, and uh, her cat Nova, and uh, some guy that looks like me with a bad haircut. Um, we're going to extend this research into the Pell sequence and then the associated Pell sequence, which is the following. You might recognize this as the numerators of the convergence of the square root of two and the denominators of the convergence. So 7 fifths, 17 twelfths, this converges to root two. So this is not the Pell-Luca sequence, although some uh, references do call this thing Pell-Luca, but if I multiply the top row by two, I get the Pell-Luca. One question I want to think about today for the open questions thing is perfect powers. How many, do we have any perfect powers in the sequence? Like in the Fibonacci sequence, it's well known, the numbers one, eight, and 144 are the only perfect powers. In the Luca sequence, the numbers one and four are the only perfect powers. In the Pell sequence, the number one is the only perfect power. In the, uh, and uh, oh, sorry, 169, obviously. And that's it for the Pell sequence. But how about this sequence? I would really like us this afternoon to solve this. Jordan Spoker has some ideas, and if we can solve that problem, we can do this order fee function project that we're thinking about. We did this, this is the one missing link. And then lastly, we're looking at the zonal periods of the Pell sequence modulo a Pell number, or the zonal periods of the Kell sequence modulo a Kell number, Kell meaning associated Pell sequence. I'm just using the word Kell to save time. This is well known when we change these F's, these P's to the Fibonacci to 
Fs, and when we change the Qs to Ls, this is well known. In fact, even in that setting, you can change these to uh, uh, F and L and L and F, and that's also actually the L and F. These the mixed ones aren't known, but when that's the Pisano period of the Fibonacci sequence module, a Fibonacci number is known. And the Fibonacci, the Pisano period of a Luca sequence mod, the Luca number is known. But how about this? Um, we haven't done this yet, so if you want to steal this research before us, go for it. Um, just we'll race, or we'll do it together. Harmony. Yes. And then now a real end slide. By the way, this three goes fast. Just that. Um, that's it. I'm done now. I'm happy to speak with anyone during our 10:30 a.m. to 11 break, which is actually longer now. This is my friend's dog named Dog, dog Tur Pepper. Um, real life, really um, silly, but I love it. And that's it. These are the references. Um, and one slide. This is how you reach Dan and I. If you want to reach Dan and I. So, really, thank you. <laughs> so you were looking at you know, 20 and you found the right way to look at 20 mm -hmm. and the 10 is half of 20. Yes. Have you tried this with say other integers, you know, k, maybe certain functions of k, and then these functions of multiples of k so you can look at the sum and divide by k. Say so so again, like what's so for instance, instance, instead of doing multiples of four and then taking a half for the index. Okay, what yeah, that was just in that one class of examples. Yes. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like multiples of nine and one third for the index. Well, when a multiple, when it's an odd number, when k is an odd number, we're in trouble okay. all the time. So all the time. Like, so even multiples of nine is, is just about as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Odd numbers are difficult, and a lot of that has to do with the uh, Pisano periods um, being even. For it, it, there's some issues with the Pisano periods. So. There's a question what in the chat? From, yeah, Dan. from Dan. Oh, cool. All right. Uh, from Dan. Um, so it, I, I think if you remember like the strange fascinating connection, uh, that, how that's phrased. Wait, wait, sorry, I can't hear you. Wait, what's going on? But if you remember the strange fascinating connection, like how that's phrased. Um, another, I don't know if you know this, but, um, another way to think about that is that's like that log connection between two post um, Okay. This is kind of a category theory um, way of thinking of those types of relationships. And there's a lot to know about them. Um, and so you might be able to find a lot of your, um, like a lot of the same flavor, be able to prove a bunch of different things if you look up um, Galois connections uh, between post sets. Um, okay. When you said wall connections, you were Galois. Oh, Galois. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the name comes from Galois theory. It's very similar to the relationship between um, uh, groups and okay. the sequence. I'd like to talk to you more about that. Yeah, yeah. Dr. said wall because wall is a big name in Pisano periods. Uh -huh. yeah. research. Probably should have been in the references. Okay, I think there's a, a comment or a question from the audience yeah. in Zoom land. Uh, yeah, can you unmute yourself? Can we hear? Unmute. No, you look muted. Yeah. Um, this is Dan, by the way, everybody. Where are you, Dan, by the way? I'm in Utah. And I'm thanks for being up at two in the morning for this. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, all I was gonna add is that with the odd case, while it is hard, we do know that no primes of the form mod three or seven mod ten can divide uh gypsum. But now the and a more interesting question as well that we posed in our paper would be to see what else we can say about these odd cases. And to see if we can uh, restrict any other primes. Yes, Dan's talking about restrictions of primes in this slide right here. Um, in this case here, when we get these twos and ones, because um, yeah, we we know what uh, the gypsum values can actually be like numbers like eleven, or, but those these have to do with Pisano periods that are odd. Most people in this room probably know the Donald periods are always even for every Fibonacci and Lucas sequence under any moduli value, they're always even. But you, you can get these oddball odd periods uh, for certain initial conditions in the Fibonacci sequence. Yeah. And so, what we did, and I did not talk about it, and this is a valuable part of the talk what are the restrictions on the prime factors of gypsum? Um, and that's an interesting part of the paper. I thought it was a bit more technical to talk about here, so I didn't emphasize it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for our speakers? 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.